Susan is consulting curator at the Clinton Hill Alan Tran Foundation. She holds a PhD from Northwestern University and wrote her doctoral dissertation, and I have to say a, a seminal study, a hugely important study, on the American Abstract Artists Group. A professor of art history at the University of Southern California for more than 20 years, she also served as a curator of the permanent collection at the Whitney Museum of Art. Uh, as well as collector of documents for the Archives of American Art and was chief curator at the Farnsworth Art Museum in Rockland, Maine. Her book on the life of Charles Biederman will be published by Hudson Hills Press this November, so really look out for that. And today she'll be talking about Biederman, and the title of her talk is Charles Biederman and the Colors of Light. Thank you, Mary Kate, and thanks to the Newark Museum for a beautiful exhibition that's so intelligently and, uh, and thoughtfully installed. I'm, I'm sure you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And, uh, and this morning's talks, from which I've already learned a great deal and found a great amount of inspiration and, and convergence with uh, some of the work I've been uh, engaged with for the last few years. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the art and life of Charles Biederman whose uh, typical, ebullient, smiling, expressive face you see on the screen. Charles Biederman was born in 1906 in Cleveland, Ohio, and he died in Red Wing, Minnesota in, in 2004. He lived to be 98 years old, and he uh, made art until he was about 92. His long life um, really sets the stage for uh, something uh, very similar to uh, what Marshall described in The Art of John Farron. Uh, an, an art life that's episodic, that has many different twists and turns, and that has relationships with people in other countries outside of the United States that are very, very important. A, a central fact that surrounds the efforts in the life of Charles Biederman is something that I think a lot of us who've studied abstract art find to be basic and true that reductive abstract art has never been very popular nor very well received in the United States. As much as we here in this room might love it and uh, others we know, um, you can imagine, you know, I know friends and family and typical people I meet in other walks of life haven't a clue and aren't interested. And people who take abstract art extremely seriously and love it and for whom it is uh, a way forward in their understanding of the, the world and, if not the universe, um, we often find this upsetting and puzzling, and so it was in the life of Charles Biederman. He was born to a very simple family. His mother and father were immigrants from Czechoslovakia, which was um, uh, a turbulent and poor country. His mother came uh, over separately and met his father. He grew up in a household where the, the language of the home was Czech, and he often dressed in Czech costume when he went out to grammar school. You can imagine how alienating that could have been. Um, as a boy, he, uh, his father was um, um, angry and disappointed with America, seldom spoke to him or his younger brother. And his mother was, uh, supported the family in large measure uh, through her work as a seamstress. Little Charles Biederman, who was very, very handsome and blonde and a robust little boy, uh, often helped his mother with her embroideries as a little boy and was uh, drawn to, to um, artistic pursuits even as a child. He ended up leaving school in the 10th grade when his father lost an yet another job and they were in danger of losing their home. And so the two young boys had to leave school and to go out and to work and help the father. However, Charles Biederman was fortunate to find employment in an advertising agency. And he rose through the ranks in the next three years, uh, doing paste-ups, layouts, drawings, a, a lot of different, he learned a lot of different skills. And the men around him encouraged him not to get stuck in commercial art. They encouraged him to save his money, and at the end of the three years, he had saved a considerable amount and to go to art school, and so he did. He went to the Art Institute of Chicago. At the Art Institute of Chicago, which he entered in 1926, 
Uh, he became a, a very stellar student. He won numerous scholarships and prizes. He also was privileged to be in the classroom of someone most of us are familiar with. Um, he was um, in the art history class of the great Helen Gardner, whose art through the ages most of us have spent many hours memorizing and, and laboring over. Biederman was a typical art student. He felt it was a waste of his time to study at the feet of this woman who was throwing pearls of wisdom at the students. Uh, art Through the Ages was published that very same year, 1926, and Helen Gardner was famous, but uh, Biederman and his, and his fellows could care less. Uh, he, this, is, um, a, this is a photograph of Biederman's home in Red Wing, Minnesota, which I, I put on the screen to kind of emphasize the Midwesternness and the sense of um, groundedness in, in his Midwestern identity, which we see, and yet also his divergence and his difference and his originality, which you see in the colors of the house, which still stands and still looks very much like this. Biederman won his scholarship, but left before graduation. Another, another thing that happened in that same year, 1926, at the Art Institute of Chicago, was the museum was the recipient of the very great Helen Birch Bartlett collection. And, be, and suddenly, in the midst of the rather staid Art Institute, were works by Cezanne and Picasso and Lautrec, and so on and so forth, and the great Grand Jatte by Serra. And Biederman discovered Cezanne and began to uh, tell his fellow students about it. But the teachers he had at the Art Institute told the students never to go in that gallery. <laughs> and Biederman, being quite rebellious and original, took his fellow students into the gallery, and he was promptly expelled. So he then moved on to, he spent a very, very difficult three years in Chicago uh, trying to be, to be an artist and uh, found a very difficult time until he met through a fellow art student named Julie Moore, who was a very attractive young lady. He met her brother-in-law, John Pierce Anderson. Uh, this is a work that Biederman made in New York City in 1935, which is typical of his, already of his style. As you can see, it's heavily influenced by uh, Picasso's cubism. It has overlays of surrealist biomorphism to it. And yet, it has a, a very rich color palette. It has a strong architecture. It's uh, certainly not an original, uh, highly original work, but it's a very beautiful one. And throughout his career, we can say of Biederman's work that it is always exceptionally beautiful and well-made. Uh, his, his sense of the architectonic aspects of the painting are already there. In, in Chicago, he met uh, Julie Moore's brother-in-law, whose name was John Pierce Anderson. John Anderson would prove to be an, a crucial figure in Biederman's life. John Anderson was Biederman's own age, born the same year. But he was the son and heir to Ale the fortune made by Alexander Pierce Anderson, who was a farmer inventor who lived in Red Wing, Minnesota. Uh, Alexander Anderson invented the process, the high heat, high compression process that would take a kernel of rice or a kernel of wheat and cook it and puff it. So every time you eat your Rice Krispies <laughs> or your puffed wheat, <laughs> you are, you are uh, involved with something that was patented by Alexander Pierce Anderson.